everyone. Freddie, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Freddie Lajabardi. Uh, I'm the CEO and president of the CISA Twenty Foundation. And uh, we're here basically to serve the needs of the community, especially bridging that STEM divide that exists for kids that are in schools that don't have uh, STEM programs, like robotics programs, for example. So uh, that's my title, and that's kind of what we do. So hello, my name is Dan. Um, I teach at ASU, the engineering school. And I'm a volunteer here and one of the, the mentors for the different robotics teams that we have here. Thank you. Awesome. I think we're ready to go. We're ready to go. Uh, does anybody have any questions about what they do before we start and tour around? No? Yes, no. I'm just joining and then we'll be able to move around. And while uh, Corey is walking around, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to just unmute and ask too, but, or you can just text it, uh, or I mean, put it in the chat and I'll be keeping track of that. Where the students will come in and we have our wall that's going to be decorated with uh, metal, uh, printing on metal, the different photographs of all the different activities that they do. And then if you turn around and face that way, you'll see that this is where we're going to have our smart television plugged into the wall up there, we'll have different awards and plaques, and our way to greet people when they come and join the uh, STEM Center here. And uh, so basically, the first room we have the CAD room, computer aided drafting. Okay, Danelle, which are you seeing me for where I am, or where do I need to point my camera? Is, are you guys being able to see everything? Yeah, when you turned it around, that looked good, and the sound sounds pretty good also. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I'll turn it up just a tad. Here we go. Okay, so in this room, uh, we have four CAD computers. So these are computers that are set up to do uh, SolidWorks CAD software, so computer-aided drafting software, which is an industry standard, and the web-based one called Onshape. So we have two platforms by which students can learn how to CAD uh, draw things for manufacturing and basically testing all the different parts we want on the robot where we don't have to waste our time building it, we can test it out and measure things in CAD and plan out things. So this is an industry standard software. So kids learn how to use this. They're able to use this at whatever job that they go to if they use any kind of you know, manufacturing software. Um, the reason why this room is green is this half of the room is going to be a video production uh, room. So the green screen is for that. So once we have uh, funding to set up this lab, this uh, studio, we'll be able to make our own video content here and podcasts and all that kind of stuff like that. So the CAD people have to put up with the green walls because that's what we decided that we were going to do. <laughs> A multifunctional room. I yes. love it. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, pop them into the chat and Rachna will hold on to those for Freddie or I will turn around and see if I can't uh, ask those questions. And Danelle, if you see them, ask them out loud so that we can answer them. So this is our 3D printing room that was uh, basically sponsored by MakerBot. They provided all the printers for this room. Uh, it serves two purposes. One, it's going to be a in-person teacher certification place, so teachers can get certified on how to use 3D printers. But it's also for use for our robotics team and other robotics teams that come to the STEM Center that need help building parts or anything for their robot that you have to custom make because you know, those parts don't exist or whatever. They're basically inventing those parts. So that's what this, this room is for. Um, and we plan on getting more 3D printers. That's why there's a little bit more space. Um, this is the sketch printer. This is their introductory level printer. And then this is one of their more advanced ones called the Method X. And the Method X can print multiple different materials, including carbon fiber. And we just recently found out uh, it can print metal. Now, before Ooh. you get too excited, it prints metal combined with plastic and you have to send the part that you printed which is normally printed larger, maybe 20% larger, you sent it off to a place where they do a process called sintering, where they actually melt the piece that you made so that the plastic gets melted out of the way and the metal melts together. It becomes a metal product and they ship it back to us. Oh my gosh. That's so awesome. that's one of the things we're going to be doing a test case of here soon. Woo. All right. So MakerBot 3D Printing Certification Center. That's pretty amazing. Hey, quick question, that, Corey. can you have yep. them just again say, which robotics competitions are these uh, for? Is it first specific? And also the student population that you're working with again? So our student population, uh, we serve uh, the Chandler area, probably, I don't know the exact square miles, maybe anywhere between five to eight square miles uh, around the STEM center. They're mostly charter schools, but some comprehensive high schools where they don't necessarily have robotics programs. 
And we're focused at the STEM Center. We are focused on FRC, uh, the first program, and uh, uh, FTC, the other, uh, the other lower level program. But that doesn't mean that other robotics programs can't come and use the facilities here. It's just a matter of scheduling with us to be able to come and use some of the things. Oh, and RoboSub is the other competition. Uh, it's uh, uh, through an organization called RoboNation. So two robotics platforms that we have uh, that we're based here, um, but we're open to helping other programs as well. Um, I guess we'll move on to the next room. Is there something you want to show? Yeah. Did, did that answer the question, Danelle? Yeah, that's perfect. And is it just middle school and high school or just high school? It's primarily high school and college. We have a few middle school students, but that's on a case by case basis. Gotcha. That's what I thought. I think. Before we move on, is that a CAD model you're looking at in the room? Oh, yeah. So this is what it's the same. This is the actual part that was made. Look at that. So there's the part uh, designed in CAD and solid. Is that SolidWorks? This is on shape. On shape. Sorry. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> so you can see this is a pretty complicated system, right? And so by having the 3D model already made, it made the assembly process much easier and also helped guarantee that all the parts were going to fit together properly before we actually manufactured it. And how much did that manufacture? To cost? Just uh, curious if you have an estimation. So the most expensive part would be these two motors. I think these are about $160 or $70. Um, they also okay. include the motor driver as well. The aluminum stock is not super expensive. Awesome. Um, so I'd say a few hundred dollars. And is that um, open source software or is this is how much is, yes, yeah. Yeah. okay. So for, if you are, if you have an educational account, you can get it for free. That's great, okay. So, and so the, there's a caveat with that. Everything you build on Onshape, if you have this, the free account is accessible to anyone else on Onshape. So it's not private. Oh. So it's open source in that sense. Yeah. Um, not that anyone's gonna specifically look for your part, but it is searchable so they can find it and download a copy for themselves if they want to. Oh, that's interesting thoughts for robotics competitions. I know, those, I know those robotic robotics competitors and they might just like to hear that information. Um, this is awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay. Also like wicked cool that we get to see the part that was on, that was um, designed on that program. Yes. Well, this was also inspired by one of the robots that won the world championship. So the competition was in April. We were able to take pictures of what they were working on, look at videos, and try to basically reverse engineer to make make our own. Because we have competitions basically from April all the way through November. And in case you didn't notice, this red part is 3D printed. And did you print it in your 3D print lab yeah. right here? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wicked cool, as you said, Danelle. I love that. All right, and we're moving along. So this room right here is our, what we call our uh, shop classroom. Uh, the lights, uh, Ooh, there you so go. these tables can be configured. They're all on wheels that can change in height too. We have drop down electricity from the ceiling. We've got video projection. So this can be used to like teach soldering classes or go to a classroom of any kind or lecture, anything like that. Um, we've also used this room for toy hacks where uh, we'll modify toys and then donate them to United Cerebral Palsy. So kids that don't have um, normal motor control skills can be able to operate the buttons that we've manipulated or changed that are bigger. The last one we just had was actually really cool. It was a Jeep hack. We actually took toy electric Jeeps that kids could ride in, but normally there's a foot pedal accelerator, but kids with cerebral palsy don't have uh, control of their feet. At least for these students that we, the kids that we were dealing with didn't. So we put the button for the accelerator on the steering wheel so that the kids could push the button with their hand and the Jeep would move forward and they can steer. And so we had four kids show up and be able to leave with the Jeep that they could drive on their own. So keep in mind, these kids have never moved themselves. They've always been carried around or in wheelchairs because the wheelchairs uh, that would be electrically mobile are too expensive to buy for kids to grow out of them. So this was the first time we had a video of a girl driving herself around and just the, the look on her face was priceless because she'd never been able to make herself move. So that, the, that's one side of it. The other side of it is to show the students here what a little bit of STEM technology, a little bit of applied STEM can do to change someone else's life. Ooh. And so that's, that's what we really focus on. It's great for helping everybody, but we're also interested in making um, not just the robots, but building better people. And we want them to realize 
that the skills they learn here can affect someone else's life. And Dan will talk about Love. the toy hack. Not just the robot, but making better people. I mean, come on now, Freddie, we need to coin this. This sounds really awesome. The and it's good question. stuff. We have Say a again? Question. We have yeah, a question go ahead. from Elizabeth. Go ahead with the question. Yeah, and she's asking, um, was that part of the Go Baby Go program from uh, FRC First program? So it's it's inspired by Go Baby Go. So Go Baby Go was started by the University of Delaware by James Gall or Cole Galloway. Um, and so he's a physical therapist. And so he recognized that a lot of children's uh, mobility needs were not being met, um, specifically because the cars that the, uh, the wheelchairs that were commercially available were either too large or too expensive for most children. And so he went in and he developed a solution to smaller six volt cars. Um, and that works great for really young kids. The problem is these kids, right? They do what most kids do and they get bigger, right? And so they grow out of these cars. What? And so the problem with that was after a certain point, they would lose their mobility because they would get too big for the small cars, but they were still too small for the commercial wheelchairs. And so there was this awkward gap and it was almost in some ways more traumatic because they had their independence and then it was kind of stripped away again. And so what we were doing is we were trying to fill that gap. So instead of adapting the six volt cards like Go Baby Go does, we were adapting large four volt cards. And the only reason why I don't think that Cole Galloway and his group do the larger cards is that they're not engineers, right? So he's a physical therapist. And so because they're larger cars, they have more, have a uh, higher battery voltage, right? So they're a little bit more dangerous. They've got two motors as opposed to one. And so it took a little bit of engineering skill to figure out how to do it safely. And so that's what we're trying to do. So, and if you teach young people engineering skills, they can do the same thing. And then they can use their ideas to multiply this idea of physical therapy and engineering design process together. Exactly. It's great. And so, I mean, we, we noticed a lot of the younger students, they're shooting a basketball into the hoop is fun with the robot, but it's not going to be something that's going to change their life in the sense that's going to change which career path they're looking to go into, mm. right? They're looking to make a bigger impact in the world. They're not just looking to have balls and go into hoops. Besides, even if they were interested in that, there's not many jobs where you can design robots to shoot basketballs into hoops, right? <laughs> right? It's, not, it's not an end goal, it's an entry point, right? And so what we, we do is we show them alternative projects where they're using the same skills, but they're actually being applied to helping someone in the community. And so the one of the things I like about these, these toys, so we also adapt uh, toys. Um, so basically this kind of fold, it's a bubble blower, okay? So if you put bubbles to open it, it would actually blow up bubbles. It has this button in the back that could be difficult for certain children to be able to access and to use, okay? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this toy more accessible, easier to use. So what we did is we basically hacked into it and we put a audio jack coming out the back of it. And what this allows is any AT switch to be plugged into there. So there's a lot of different types of switches. Some are commercial, some are you know 3D printed like this one is. And did you it, all 3D, 3D print that? This yeah. is all 3D printed, yeah. Okay. And so awesome. basically it's, it's a, it's a switch that's in parallel, which allows the toy to be activated either way. Oh, that's awesome. And effectively what we're doing is we're soldering two wires to this toy, and all of a sudden it becomes accessible to a lot more people. And something else, like a button that you buy commercially is like 60 bucks. This was printed for about five bucks. Five bucks, that's awesome. But yeah. what I really like is the soldering piece. So you teach your students how to solder. Yeah. And do you do that in this area, yeah. in this room here? So you have soldering irons around? Yes, so we got a bunch of irons and we'll bring them out. We'll pull down the power, the outlets and then they'll plug in. So this is where you teach students mainly about circuitry. So you're, you're doing- Anything, anything. Okay. You do anything with this. Okay. Circuitry is just This is your proto many... prototyping lab in a sense. Yeah, it's a clean, it's a clean workspace. So <laughs> we're, not, we're not having like metal chips flying around. Right? Yeah. So for smaller stuff like that, that's what we do. Now, is this idea, like, was this something that you both said, okay, we're gonna show you how to hack into something for a, a purpose? Um, or was that something that a student came up with and said, this you know? This is something that Dan has been experienced with in the past and he brought to Cecil Twitty. Oh, we, that's we didn't come up with it ourselves. Dan brought this to us. Yeah, that's I've awesome. been doing this since 2014, 2015. And originally I got started with Google BB Go. And then from there, we're like, okay, what are, what are some other things we can adapt? So that would be pretty simple, right? Okay. And so I originally brought this to first robotics teams to say, okay, let's use this like as a training. Uh, mechanism, right? So we had a brand new group of students that were going to join our team. 
you need to teach some basic, you know, electrical skills, such as how to uh, crimp wires, how to strip wires, how to solder, all these different things, right? So let's do a project where they actually get to use these skills and learn it in a way that's more practical than the other just say, here, just crimp some wires. For no and not just more practical, but more purposeful. Right. Okay, that was worth the price of admission, folks. That rate, That is really a great way, I think, to bring STEM into all those STEM skills into your classroom. Um, pop in the chat if you've done something like this in your classroom. This is and, that's really cool, Dan. And just to give you an anecdote, so I had a student I was working with for about five years. She joined the team in eighth grade, and then she stayed all the way to her senior year. For the first four years that she was on the team, she wasn't really interested in the robot. She was interested in going to the competition. She would, you know, go to the stands and cheer for the team. She would help with like the imagery and the outreach and all that kind of stuff. But as far as like working on the robot, she wasn't really that interested. We originally started doing these projects for new students coming in since they didn't have that experience. And as we were doing that, she said, hey, is it okay if I learn how to solder too? Is it okay that? I love that. And so for the first time, she started inviting herself to learn these technical skills. And the previous one we invited her, she wasn't interested, right? And it's because we made that connection. We said, okay, you're not just learning how to solder so you can help a robot shoot a basketball into a hoop. You're learning solder so you can help Joey or you can help this person in your community. Right, and that was all that mattered, right? That made that much different experience for them. And so that's why we try to do both, right? Some students are interested in the robot, some students are interested in other things. We understand that students are coming from all different places, so we want them to have a well-rounded experience. Um, another anecdote, we had a football player who joined our team. Uh, he was, I think, the co-captain, and he joined our team senior year, and he said, my goal is to take our robot and smash it into other robots. Right? <laughs> that's what he wanted, he played defense. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to smash robots into each other. At the end of the season, he, he went up into a crowd of about 100 people with family members and sponsors and whatnot and said, you know what, five years from now, I'm not going to remember anything about this robot, but I'm going to remember the projects that we worked on and how it impacted our community. That's what he took away from the team. And how, it the, how the project impacted our community. That's pretty amazing. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Wow, that's great. Are there any questions for Dan about any of this work? I'm just and curious, Corey, how do they find the children that they are adapting things for? Mm, good question. That's a good question. So there's a lot of different communities out there. So one is 18makers.org. So there's a Facebook page where you can literally just go on there and say, hey, is there anyone in the Phoenix area that's looking for adaptive toys? And there'll be tons of teachers, parents who'll say, yes, us, please. These costs to buy the toys already adapted could be $150. This toy costs $10 at Target, right? And so if you can adapt it yourself, that saves a lot of money. And all of a sudden it becomes a lot more accessible. And so we work with schools. One school we've been working with a lot is Excel. Um, so that's a school in North Phoenix. And so if they don't need the toys directly, they know families who do, right? Um, we've also worked with the, the cerebral palsy. Was it? Um, United Cerebral Palsy. Yes, United Cerebral Palsy. There's all sorts of organizations out there that are looking for support. Um, that's not the hard part. The hard part is... There is no hard part. <laughs> that's what, that's what these, these, these projects are so crazy because it's such a simple thing, right? It, it makes such a big impact for such little effort. It's, it's almost a no brainer. Simple yet profound. Thanks. If there are no other questions, I'll let you guys move towards, sure. but that, that is really awesome. And, and if there are questions, just keep them coming, Danelle. Sorry. Sorry. Um, oh. Sorry. I yeah, thought just with our speakers just because they don't get to see the side of the chat and some of the wonderful comments. Um, Elizabeth just said, love it. I've seen lots of great innovation projects from participants in the first program, and I love that they push themselves so they can obtain the goals, the skills to make their goal. And then Joseph said, um, he said some great things too. He said, really appreciating the connection between social entrepreneurship, STEM, and hands-on learning. And then he also put down, and the frugal innovation concepts. Now, the word he added at the end is a word I recognize in Hindi, which I don't know if he was speaking in Hindi. He said, jugard. Jugard means the ability to, it's literally frugal innovation, like taking pit, bits and pieces from here and there and making it work at the cheapest cost. So that was a very um, Hindi word. Nice, nice one there, Joseph. <laughs> There's the diversity coming in too. I like it. DEI and STEM. We can't wait to, to continue on. Thank you, Rajna, for sharing those comments with us. All right, go ahead. Okay, so now we're going into our big room. It's called the Fab Lab, Fabrication Lab. Dun, dun, dun. This room is a little bit bigger than what you've seen so far. So this structure, you want me to put that here? 
that you see here is a 10 by 10 structure. This is what a pit would look like at a robotics competition. And um, if I had a light switch here. So the robot would come in between matches and the team would do whatever repairs or you know, programming or whatever they need to get done so the robot can be ready for its next match. Can you hear okay? Yep. Yeah, you can hear Freddie okay? All right. Yep. And so uh, they have the tools around them. They get used to it. So we have this here so other robotics teams that are starting can see what a pit looks like. And then our team gets used to working in a pit so it's not a boring thing when they go to a competition. Um, plus, we have to keep as much of this team's stuff in one place because the STEM center is used for other activities. So this is a typical pit. The next and it's a very clean that. pit. I've never seen a pit so clean. Uh, I, would, I would like it cleaner, but that's okay. <laughs> so this is what you see here, this big carpeting area is half of a high school first robotics field. And so this structure here is one of the field implements that the robot has to interact with. So they can shoot balls into the top goal or into the bottom goal. And then at the end of the match, the robot has to start at one of these lower poles and then climb them up successively to get to the higher one. And if they're hanging from that at the end of the game, they get more points. And so you can imagine there'd be two of these on the field and one of those ball goals on the field. So each team has their own corner which to climb. Uh, right behind you, if you look down here, this is the robot that actually, let me grab a ball. So this is their creation. I have a feeling this one won something or other. Probably, what place did you guys uh, come up with with this? So this robot, I think the best that's ever placed is second or third in a, in a competition. Second or um, third. And so the balls would come in this way, be harvested, and then put into what I call a hopper, and then the camera here, which is looking for the retroreflective tape on the top, once it gets at the right distance, then the shooter can start spinning and then it shoots the ball and the ball then goes into the ball. And at the end of the game, this climbing mechanism, which is sort of extended right now, the robot drives in here, grabs onto the pole, and this is actually in an upward position when it's climbing so that the pole then gets locked into this space underneath here. Oh, right there, yeah. And then the, the, the hook can unhook itself and the robot can tilt itself and grab the next pole. Oh, and so successively go to the next pole. And then hopefully at the end, it's, it's hanging on this above the top one. <laughs> um, so this is the robot called Red Bull. Uh, it will be competing at the state championships in two weeks, uh, a little less than two weeks. And the team is rebuilding this climbing mechanism. This one's a little flaky. It's not 100% reliable. Uh, if you spin down here, this strange looking field here, this is for the FTC competition. So these are like shoebox sized robots, two robots against two robots. And the goal for this competition is they have to take these cones and place them on top of these. And uh, the more they put on there the, and the higher they are, they, they get more points. And if you can own the pole, like if you have blue cap all the way across, you get more points if you have a, a row of these across the field. So this is wow. just starting, so we don't have any robots to show you right here. Awesome. But that, so FTC just came out with this competition. Yeah. And then how long do you guys have to build a robot? Like, I know some of, some of our listeners may not be familiar with FIRST. So how long is the season? And like, when do you well, get- FTC, I think it's a couple months. Yeah, they start in like early September and then their first competition is mid-November, but then they'll keep going all the way until potentially March. Okay. And then with FIRST Robotics, the high school level, um, they typically have about eight weeks before the regionals start. Um, but we also have something else now in Arizona due to the Arizona Diamondbacks and Cobra High School, Cobra High School, Cactus High School. Mm -hmm. They have a summer series now. So if a high school team builds a robot, you don't just go to one regional competition because you can't afford to go anywhere else. You can do the whole summer series and it goes all the way until November, all free, no charge. So if you build a robot, you invest in the robot, you have many competitions to go to now. Oh, that's which awesome. is something that was kind of a thing that a lot of teams were, or teachers may have been upset with. They're gonna do all this work for one competition. Yeah. Unless we can get money to go out of state to other competitions. That's new. There are two in-state competitions now, but they're back to back one weekend after the other. Okay. But now with the summer series, you can compete almost all year. It's pretty amazing. Is that just for first? Like it's for, for first robots. Is it for FTC as well as FRC or just FRC? Just FRC. Okay. So you, 
because they can be very expensive, the, the robots to, to make. And generally, the, what I thought was in January, that's when... The build season starts. Yeah. That's when the game's announced. Right. And then you have until about March when the, re the regionals Regional start. Regionals, March, and usually end of March. And so then if they Well, they go to that... May. They go from March to May. Oh, that's or, great. Because if you count the world championships, then pretty much you go sure. to May. And then there's summer. April. And there's summer opportunities now as well. Now there's summer opportunities to go all the way through November. So I will ask... Freddie to put that information into the chat so that you guys um, can get that information about the summer because I did not know that myself. Uh, any questions so far? I just want to say kudos to knowing about that series because it is uh, having been involved with first when I was in Idaho it was same similar thing right other competitions were super far away and so it's good to hear I hope other states are making a note. Yep. So this, what I'm standing in here, this is what we call our guest pit. So when teams come here to use our field, they have a place to set up that they can practice working in a pit. It keeps them also self-contained in an area here too. What you see here, this machinery, this is a portable machine shop. This is part of the Arizona First uh, Foundation. So they actually take this machine shop. It's all on one structure. It gets taken to the regional competition. So if at a tournament, you need something built and you need some machinery, it can operate to make the parts you need. During the year, though, it's stored here so teams can sign up and come and use uh, this because, you know, otherwise just sitting around collecting dust. Uh, so this is a new thing. They used to just have this in storage, but now it's available for teams to come and, I guess, uh, reserve a space to work on. Uh, it's in the middle of having a few parts refurbished. There's a new bandsaw that's going to go on there. So it looks a little bit cluttered right now. But what's really neat about this is that uh, from someone at, uh, I was at GCU and we we would host the first turn first tournaments, the Western Regional tournaments, and this, what what, what would you just call it? a portable a portable, a portable machine, machine shop. shop? We would have to like literally get this portable machine shop into the arena for a short amount of time, and we asked that question: where does where do you store this? Like why is why why are kids using this? And they said, we don't know. It's in microchip. So I'm really glad that it's actually now stored here at CCA Puede so students can use it. So that's really awesome. And Corey, quick question from the chat. That's just for FRC, right? Not for FTC? Just for FRC, uh, not yes. FTC. I, I suppose if an FTC team wanted to come here now and use it, they could. There's no rules or anything against it, but it was primarily designed for FRC. So they may not need that kind of machine they shop? They don't have that at a tournament. For FTC? Yeah. Okay, so FTC probably doesn't need as much, you know, um, portable machine shop goods. Hand, hand tools will do most of the stuff that you need for FTC. Okay, did you Perfect. hear that part? I think that I think that I think I'm that answers, I think that answers Elizabeth's question. Perfect. Okay, cool. Thank you. So moving on to this side of the room. This is one huge space, and you're saying that other teams can come and borrow or rent this space. But we have our, this is our newest machine. It's a laser cutter. So it has roughly a four foot by four foot cutting area. So you can put wood in here, different kinds of plastics. Big laser cutter. And it can cut um, any of those materials. We use it a lot for prototyping parts because it's easier to cut and much more faster to cut this pieces out of wood and test out things like this before we actually make them out of metal because this takes time to do. I don't see a wooden piece here, but normally we have a Some prototyping. So this is the cheaper. new climber that they're building that's going to go on the robot I showed. This is the, the you were saying that the climber's not where you want it to be. And yeah. so therefore this they're is what you're building. Yeah. Okay, this is great. But so this we have is our, a great way to prototype. Yeah, I got our CNC louder. So this is just a lot of different pieces of metal. Um, we have a mill. And we have a lathe. So we have the basic machine shop stuff. The only thing we don't have now that we probably want to get is a CNC mill. So a computer can do the cutting. This one's a manual mill, which is a good skill. Kids need to learn how to do all the manipulation themselves, but there are limitations to this. Um, and then the last thing we're going to show you, this is the Desert Wave Team. The Desert Wave stands for Women in Autonomous Vehicle Engineering. And this- Women in Autonomous Vehicle Engineering. So this is an all women's college team. Uh, this is the robot they built first, it was called Phoenix. This competed in the RoboSub competition, it's in San Diego, it's an international competition, 50 teams from 12 countries. They finished first in the US and third in the world with this robot. 
Did you hear that? First in the U.S., third in the world, right here, Chandler, Arizona, folks. Woohoo! And Dan, this is amazing. No, the students did that. Students and Dan did. says it, it was the we students, just drove of the course. Van and bought the meals. So, have you guys ever driven the van and bought the meals? I, I bought that T-shirt too. So this is their next robot they're working on. This, this the first robot was about maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars. This is in the seventy to eighty thousand dollar range. So a little more sophisticated. It's got things such as fiber optic gyros. This one has the three axis fiber optic gyro. Just that piece of equipment alone is fifteen thousand dollars. Wow. So these are things that are donated by companies because they want students to learn how to use these pieces of equipment. So when they go out in the real world. They may lobby for that equipment for the projects that they're working on or that they know how to do it or that maybe go work for those companies. There's a whole myriad of reasons why they want kids to learn how to use this stuff. Um, navigating underwater, you can't use GPS, so they have to learn how to use DDLs, which basically is a sonar type of device that keeps track of the echolocation so uh, when it's moving, so it knows how far it's moving in what direction, kind of like a dolphin does. Um, and so the reason why you see this fan here, this is robots actually connected to the internet so the kids can remotely log into this and program it. And since we're in a, this is a non-air conditioned room right now, we have a fan blowing on the CPU to keep it cool. Any questions about RoboSub, female robotics champions, um, remote work on RoboSubs from what a car? College are, what college are they from? Arizona State University. Nice, fantastic. And I wanted to, uh, Corey, put in a pitch there for everybody here to, you know, if they've got connections with the women mentors, women in engineering mentors, women in STEM mentors, please, um, please connect them to CC Puede and, and get them involved in contributing their time here. And as long as we're talking about women, I'd love to know what your ratios are for your high school students in terms of uh, female versus male participants. Gotcha. So we're, we're about 50% male and then 50% either gender minority in STEM. So either female or non-binary um, or so on. Great. That's awesome. Well, that's huge. 50%. So we have, um, I think it was 19 different schools if you count Arizona State University, 20 schools represented here at the STEM Center. Uh, last year we had, uh, I think, seven schools represented. So it's grown considerably. And then we had um, seven other uh, first robotics teams come here and use the STEM Center last year. This year, we're thinking it might be 10 to 12. Right. Um, pretty soon, we're reaching our capacity because there's only so much room. Yeah. Um, so, so we are serving that, that niche. And the fact that those numbers have increased, like to 19, some of the schools are schools like the basis schools that are very academically focused, but they don't have any after-school STEM enrichment programs. And so their parents want them to do something besides school but still have it be school-ish related or STEM related, so they come here. Yeah. Um, and some charter schools are just so small, they only have 200 kids, they can't afford to do any of this stuff. Yeah. So we're here to fill that need. In fact, we went from seven to 19 schools is, is evidence that we're meeting that, we're, we're, we're needed in the community. No and when are, you, when are you starting your second location in Tucson? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that, guys? Oh, yeah. I think that Danelle has some sort of, you know, need to ha have them down in the southern area. I'm just area. curious. I'm curious. So, just a note, too, with the Desert Wave team, most of our students are from ASU, but that's just because I work there and it's easy for me to recruit students there. It's not necessarily because they have to be from there, yeah. right? We, we also had students from community college when we first started out and we're open to students from other schools as well. And they entertained um, GCU's Women of Engineer Society of Women Engineers a couple of weeks ago. And you know, ultimately, what we would like to do is is increase the amount of mentors, student mentors, from college to high school, and and uh, junior high. But ultimately, both Freddie and Dan welcomed our girls to come over as well. Like if we had a team, I'm sure that they'd be welcome. Or, or the maybe they could just be on this team, right? So it doesn't have to be just ASU only. It can be any university student. I think that's what I heard. Or it was community, five community college. Five so yeah, it's a, it's a community college robotics team. So if you are from the community and you want to, you're in college, you can be part of the team. That's great. And just in case we didn't mention it, no student pays a penny at any level to participate. If you look at all the banners and the sponsors, we get our, our funding from grants and donations from corporations. So uh, wow. that's how we survive. If we don't get the yeah, dollars, so we keep the lights on. I, 
and I know how much it costs generally having done first. And so that is a big deal. And it's thank you so much for all of that hard work because I have a very good sense of how much of a hustle that is. And, and the part of the reason for that is we want to make sure that we're reaching students who traditionally are marginalized or would not have access to these types of programs. And so for a lot of students we work with, finances would be a barrier. Right, so if, even if it was just hundred dollar dues every year, that would be enough to not allow them to participate. And so we want to make sure that we're removing all those barriers. Um, same thing with language, right? So we make sure that we recruit mentors who speak different languages. So that way, if we have students who are coming in, maybe they're speaking English as a second language, they have people that they can communicate, right, at, the, at, the, at their um, mother tongue to start with. And then as they become more comfortable, they can start to kind of shift over to more English speaking, right? But they always have that, you know, connection to start with. And just in case people didn't catch it, can you just explain the meaning of si se puede? Uh, si se puede is Spanish for yes, we can. Uh, it was a, a phrase developed, I don't know how many years ago, 50, 60 years ago, uh, during the uh, Farmers Union. Uh, Cesar Chavez. Unionization, Cesar Chavez. Uh, and so if you think about it, this is the yes, we can, yes, we can STEM Center. So it, it fits with what we're doing. I love and it. Cesar Puede, when it first started, wasn't exclusively a STEM organization. It started as a after school uh, activities program, like they did soccer and they did dance to give kids something to do in the community. And then little by little, they realized the importance of getting the kids, not just something to do, but something they could use in their life. And so STEM became a bigger and bigger focus to where now we pretty much do nothing but STEM. And how much industry support do you, I mean obviously everything in here is sponsored so is it in, mainly industry or do you have separate grants it's a combination of industry okay. support and grants so when folks on this call um, network with industry partners you can give us some information if you want to donate to high level robotics for underrepresented students um si se puede Yes. And does it go directly to the Cise Puede Foundation or can yes. they earmark it for STEM? If you go to our website, cisepuedefoundation.org, and there's a donation button on the top or a sponsorship button, I forget what it says. But when you click on that, there are four different categories that you can donate money to. So you can pick one if you want to focus it just on the STEM center or one if you want to focus on one of the teams. Oh, that's great. So you can sponsor you can a team. Choose, you can earmark your money, yes. Oh, that's great. All right, sweet. Thank you. Any questions, anything in the chat that's coming up, Danelle? Anything that you guys want to ask? I'm just curious, um, just because I know that this has always been somewhat of a battle. How how do you go about balancing for your first robotics teams, the mentor um, involvement in the design and the student um, and participation? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so we have a, a mentor agreement that the mentors have to sign. Basically, it outlines how much involvement they can have. And then we have more experienced mentors like Dan and myself that kind of regulate the other mentors. And so if there's a little bit too much mentor if input, uh, we kind of control that. Um, I, we haven't really had that issue here lately because a lot of the mentors we bring it on board, that's just a heavily, heavily, heavily emphasized thing. And a lot of our mentors, I don't know the percentage, I'd say at least half, um, have had first robotics experience. So they were on the other side. And so now as a mentor, when they were a student, they kind of see, they, they know how to hold that. That's great. And I'm assuming that's something you would share the mentor agreement because that seems like other teams could use that. Sure, we could do that. And, and also the way we're structured is we have, a, we have student officers for all the different subgroups. And then we also have a corresponding mentor who's also working with that student or students for those different roles. And the goal of the mentor is not necessarily to tell the student what to do, but is to work with that student to come up with their own goals, to come up with the game plan, to figure out how to delegate tasks, right? And to run the team as efficiently as possible. Because at the end of the day, we're teaching them the technical skills, but we're also trying to teach them leadership skills right? And some of these softer skills so that way they can be effective no matter what field they go into, right? So even if they decide they don't want to go into STEM, right? Learning how to organize and run a sub team is going to be a valuable skill regardless of what they go into. And we do all our communication through Slack. We have a professional version of Slack. So uh, I guess I'm the conversation monitor. So I make sure that no inappropriate conversations go on. And we have policies like you can't message a student alone. You have to message at least another mentor if you're talking to a student. So there's always somebody else in the loop. 
Yeah, it sounds like really amazing as I would have guessed, but I appreciate you um, ex describing it more. Looks like we have students coming in perhaps. Mentors. Mentors, it looks like we have a couple mentors coming in. So perhaps we can uh, say it's, hello to the mentors. That's how young you look. Oh yes, well, you are young comparatively to me. Yes, you are. Um, so uh, if, just uh, let me know if there are any other questions in the chat, but we'll say hello to the mentors. Yeah, we can maybe we have one more question we can ask after. Okay, sounds good. Hi, mentors. Hi. Um, you are talking to us, uh, the STEM leadership cadre, uh, STEM focused um, folks, teachers, educators, STEM directors across the across the state of Arizona. So uh, we have a question for you. How, how do you like mentoring at the Cisse Puede Robotics Foundation? It's nice to be able to give students the um, experience that I had in high school. So I was on a robotics team when I was in high school and I really enjoyed it. Um, and one of the biggest things is that there were so many female leads for my the team I used to be associated with. And that was definitely a big help to be able to see someone who looked like me, who was in a powerful position and it's nice to be able to give students um, that same experience. Thank you. What's your name? Ashley. Ashley, and what school do you go to? ASU. ASU, and what high school? You said you were a part of a robotics team. Yeah, so I grew up in Washington State, so okay. I went to Tacoma High School. And you had a lot of female mentors on that team. Um, it wasn't so much female mentors, but um, experience, like student leadership. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Okay. We need, we can learn something from Washington and you are. I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. And are you from ASU as well? Uh, I just graduated. So I'm working full time as a mechanic. Congratulations. Okay. Here in the Valley, I assume. Yep. And you're, awesome. and you're giving your time back to Cisse Puede Foundation. Yeah. Tell us why. I really like competing in robotics. So this is what got me started in engineering at high school. So from that, I went into uh, engineering as a degree. Now it's my job. Awesome. Awesome. Are you local? Did you go to high school here in Arizona? Uh, I was from Illinois. All right. Arizona, we have to learn something from Washington and Illinois, I think is what's happening. Yeah. Awesome. And in Illinois, did you have um, many females on your robotics team? Um, we had a higher percentage than average, um, but we still weren't at that 50% mark that we were shooting for. So it was uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to put you both on the spot. This is what I do well, right? Putting people on the spot. Um, any other questions? Any questions for these mentors? So we have a general question, Corey. And Joseph, feel free if you want to unmute and ask it too. Um, it was for Freddie and Dan. And they and he is wondering, oh, go ahead, Joseph. I see you unmuted yourself. You can ask a question. I think I have enough internet. My I'm in a rural, very rural part of Arizona, and it's it's uh, it gets a little shaky in the evening. But I was hoping there might be like a listserv or a newsletter that we could sign up for to follow um, what's happening, um, I, or, or even social media that we could just follow. But it would be great to kind of keep up uh, on what the needs are of the center, but also you know initiatives and um, work that's happening just to kind of keep it on the radar. So we don't have a newsletter, but we are on social media. We're on LinkedIn and we're on uh, Facebook primarily. I think the teams also have Twitter, um, but those are the two main things because mostly the audience we're aiming for are, I hate to say this, but my generation, <laughs> because they're the ones that have the ability to direct funding here. So the STEM Center focuses on that, but the teams do other things like Instagram and TikTok or whatever else that they need to do. But the, our website is also a place. So the website, Facebook, and LinkedIn are our major ways of reaching out. Um, we've thought about a newsletter, but we only have two people on staff right now. And until we can hire more people, and there's only so much we can do. Thanks, Joseph. But I do think that you could probably come and bring your students maybe on a field trip. Yep. That's, that's a very uh, doable thing. So there's, there, there I am uh, opening my mouth again. I'm not sure they wanted that, but there it is. All right. Well, just, just to kind of fill in, um, I'm not, I'm not teaching right now, but I'm working with schools all over um, Southeast Arizona and Cochise, Graham, Greenlee, Santa Cruz, and Pima. Um, and so there's a couple of really amazing teachers on right now from this area, Ty and Praveen as well. 
Um, and so this may be just trying to figure out if there's a way to do a field trip there or, or get some students from this, this area over to see something like this or adults and, and uh, funders to see like, wow, that's what's happening uh, in your neck of the woods. Could we, could we replicate it on some scale here? So this yeah, is I, a, amazing. I, I'm, I, would I, <laughs> I would think that's a great thing. If you were looking for some sponsors that might want to do something similar to this down in your area. Now I had, the opportunity of meeting Ty. So I've seen what they have down there. Um, and so it's a, it's a great start. Well, Thank let's you. provene this year. I think we're gonna get stuff going. So I'm gonna take you up on that invite and we're gonna come join you for a day. Okay. Thank you. With that, Ty? Yes, Ty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that you decided to come to this one, Ty. Cause yeah, you need to come up here and vice versa. Pick me up on the way, Ty. I'll go with you guys. <laughs> all right. right anything else you want to show the the, that's it. the we group everything the only all thing right you show you is the bathroom i don't know if you want to see uh, i guess maybe, <laughs> maybe not. um but yeah this is just a, such a great facility and we appreciate um we just appreciate what it looks like so that you guys maybe in other areas can think about what how you want to create your space even if it's not as large as this how awesome it is that they have like practice pits um, but you could create something like that at your site as well. And perhaps already have something similar. Thank you so much. Um, I love this concept of the clean room is what, uh, what Dan called it. So sometimes you just need a, a clean space to work and uh, it's just definitely got a lot of potential and a lot of storage ideas too. So, so this is the only place we have to store things. So This is the only place they have to store things and they keep that, well, you guys keep your, it's like really, really nicely cleaned. It's a nice little area just for collaboration. And again, I'm going back through the MakerBot 3D Printing Center. And then um, obviously snack time. Snack time is important, coffee. And um, then we're back around to the green room, the green screen room, podcasting and um, prototyping softwares. So there you go. You've seen the whole place and we're heading back into the boardroom area. I'm going to um, click this phone off and then we'll take any more questions that anybody has and we'll call it a wrap. So thank you so much. I'm gonna put this on me. I'm gonna actually leave this call and we'll see you on the computer. All right, we're taking a second to rearrange the, new, the other camera. I think we might have to just turn that one on. I'd shut it off. Oh, I think now we now we're unmuted. You can ask. Okay. We are, um, probably close. We're at forty-five twenty-six. Okay. Uh, questions from the gallery or anything that we can answer for you, or did you want to have a, a look around? I guess we didn't really give you a whole look around this particular room, but it's just a room with lots of nice windows and sun coming in. I'm show you <laughs> right so, here. There you go. We got a view of this room, which is really pretty. And if there's anything else in, in the chat, we're happy to answer anything else. I think Freddie's now talking to the mentors. We're, uh, we're chopped liver and now there's, they got work to do, I think. I mean, I Dan is here though, and he can continue to answer any questions. So let me, where's the camera on Dan? It's over there. He's got one camera there. there. Okay. So you can kind of see Dan from Perfect. the um, other camera. All right. Turn, put on my glasses so I can actually see what chat is here. Um, okay, so I do realize that we, we wanted, if there was a newsletter, there's not that, but we'll put the website into the chat. The chat. Do you already mm -hmm. do that? Yeah. Okay, so then. Donation as well, which is um, if you click on donate. And I think Joseph, uh, he's shared a link to um, the ArizonaFuture.org and their program saying that might be something uh, like a resource that we could look at. Um, but I don't, I think we've I answered all the questions it. in the yeah. chat. If there's, are there any more questions? My question would be, Dan, do you do any Zoom teaching? Like, let's say for example, uh, there's a teacher in uh, rural Arizona that wants 
uh, a lesson in um, maybe, you know, prototyping a part for a toy or, you know, maybe soldering or on a parallel circuit or something. Any chance you guys would be interested in helping just to the outreach piece is if you're doing something, could you, could they zoom into something that you're working on? Yeah, so we work with a lot of groups, um, not even just in Arizona, but just internationally as well. So we've got a group in Ghana that we've been supporting with getting the Lego robotics team started there. Wow. Um, and then we actually just delivered a kit to Colombia for an FTC team down there. Um, and then we've had a group from uh, New Hampshire or Connecticut, I think it was Connecticut, um, that asked us to go on a Zoom call and help them get a team started up there. So they were just basically like logistically, like what are the things we need? Who should we talk to? You know, how do we navigate, you know, the school, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, we're always willing to support different groups from anywhere. That's awesome. So you could potentially like consult. It's like, I don't even yeah. know what I'm doing. And I'm doing this first robotic and I got a bunch of money and help me. Or they don't have a bunch of money. That's what they're trying to figure out. Or they don't have a bunch of money because, <laughs> yeah. That's more likely the situation. I love it. Thank you, Dan. All right. Well, I tell you what, folks, I think this has been a great um, STEM showcase. We appreciate CSIC with the foundation. Dan, thank you so much. Hello. Freddie, who's, who's already on to the next thing with, with the mentors. And I know that your students are coming in. They come in about 630. Is that right? Uh, 530. 530. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, close up so that students can show up. And thank you so much all for attending. And I will get this video edited and it can it will be on canyonpd.com so you can check that out i'll make sure to give that uh, give that out to all the people who registered for tonight's zoom link as well as everybody in our stem leadership cadre meeting and we encourage you to continue to come to showcases like this in january we plan to have uh, Talies and west so if you're into architecture that's our next concept so Talies and west and stem lessons that they put together for students very specifically in architecture so come join us for that that's in january and until then thank you for being here we appreciate it bye